As dogs' dinners go, they don't come much bigger than the treatment of goodwill. But it matters. You can't just ignore it. Companies all the way from Vodafone to RBS have been writing down a goodwill recently. So what does that mean? And why can you not afford to ignore it as an investor? Let's take a look at that in this video. Now, there are a few numbers, but don't panic. This video does not require an accounting degree to survive. All right, we're going to keep it nice and simple, but get the key messages in relation to goodwill out nonetheless. Right, so what is goodwill? Where does it come from? And why is it such a large number? Well, here's the answer. If you're buying a business, you go out and you have a purchase price in mind. And let's say that purchase price is 100 million sterling. All right, now we won't worry exactly about where you got that number from, but let's say what you're buying, the net assets of the target company you're after, are only 80 million. So the assets that you're buying are 80 million. So that gives you a gap, all right? There's a gap there of 20 million. And that gap is what accountants call goodwill. In effect, accountants can't live with the idea that things don't balance up and match, all right? So they would say, well, I'm spending 100. That's cash going out the door, if you like. I'm getting up. 80 million of assets, back, plant, machinery, land, buildings, equipment, stock in the storeroom, that kind of stuff, and there's a gap. What is that gap? And how do accountants deal with it? Okay, well, the purchase price, that's 100 million, that could be cash. In practice, it might be one or two other things. So that's fairly easy to tick off and say, well, we know what that is. The net assets acquired, well, we could send in a firm of accountants to do some due diligence for us, check out that the target firm we're buying really does have net assets, tangible assets, assets you can kick to the value of say 80 million. So what's this difference then? What are we gonna do with this 20 million difference? You can't have 100 million going out and only 80 million coming back again. So this must be something, and accountants call it goodwill. And it represents the other stuff you're buying when you buy a business. Because after all, when you buy someone else's business, maybe you're also buying, in addition to the kind of stuff you can kick, the brand name, the market share, okay? The expertise, the employees, and that's all wrapped up in this figure accountants call goodwill. You're literally paying 20 million for the goodwill of this business, okay? Now, what happens next? And what are the kind of tricks that directors can employ to fool you, all right? Well, accountants think, what are we gonna do with this goodwill figure? I mean, if we buy someone else's business, okay, we can combine their assets with ours in our accounts. We can add together uh, I, uh, my own land and buildings, plant machinery with my tar the target company I've bought, plant machinery, land and buildings. We can add all the assets together. What are we gonna do with this awkward 20 million figure? And the answer is this, it gets stuck in the predator's balance sheet. It's called an intangible asset. And it sits there as a kind of lump, all right? Every now and again, typically annually, under the accounting rules, the directors have to check that that lump hasn't fallen in value. That's called an impairment test, all right? And if it does ever fall in value, then they have to write it down, all right? Take a chunk off it, if you like. And you might think, well, okay, that sounds in theory, all right? But it actually leaves loads of gaping gaps for the directors to pull the wool over your eyes. All right, what they're hoping is you will look at goodwill, think I kind of get what it is, but kind of don't, so I'll kind of ignore it and forget about it. All right, and analysts often do exactly that. One of the analysts' favorite numbers, which is the subject of another video, is earnings before interest tax, depreciation, and amortization. All right, EBITDA. So if there are any intangible assets being amortized, as accountants call it, in a set of financial statements, that EBITDA number will take them out. And as I say, that's the subject of another video. All right. So it's an awkward number and investors like to try and ignore it. But here are two or three reasons why you shouldn't. Okay. What are the tricks the directors can employ? Well, number one. Okay. And we've seen this recently with big write downs and the likes of Vodafone and RBS. It leaves an awful lot of scope to correct a mistake later. All right. Because if you pay 100 million for a business with net assets of 80 million, so there's a gap of 20. Who's to say you haven't horribly overpaid at the time? You haven't made a catastrophic mistake. You've gone in and bought the firm at the top of the market, and this goodwill figure you know, shouldn't be anything like 20 million. Right? Well, the beauty of the way the accountants deal with it is no one's going to find out for years later, and you've probably 
left by them reputation intact. Because what you can do is create this goodwill figure, stick it on your balance sheet, all right, years pass, and suddenly someone says, that, that 20 million, is that still worth 20 million? What is that, that, that intangible asset? And they do a little impairment check. It's quite complicated in practice, I won't go through it in this video. And they discover that actually that goodwill is only worth 10 million. All right, all that stuff you're buying, the brand name, the market share and so on has been literally impaired. It's not worth what it used to be. Okay, it happens. I mean, how many people remember Cousin's Soap these days? All the rage when I was a child, massive brand name. How many people st still use that today? Okay, um, so you can see, you know, Betamax videos. What are those? Um, so brands do impair, and the beauty of the accounting treatment is often the impairment hit isn't taken for years after the event. So in effect, the director's original mistake Overpaying for a business isn't recognized until years later. But there's more, all right? Because there are other things you can do. Just go back to this original calculation. This line here, I'm buying the target's assets, and I reckon they are worth 80 million, okay? Basically, here's a little trick. Don't worry if you don't get this fully, but here's a little trick the directors can play on you. What they can do is they can say, ooh, you know, we need to write these assets down. We need to mark them down. Um, actually, you know, um, the stock I'm, uh, that I'm buying in the target isn't worth as much as they say it's worth. The debt book isn't worth what they say it's worth. So what they do is they, they find an excuse to decrease this number. All right, let's say, let's say um, the purchase price is 100 million, but the directors can find a way to get that number down to 75 million. All right, that obviously increases goodwill to 25 million. But we've just said, well, People are going to ignore goodwill, stick it on the balance sheet, worry about impairing it later. All right, but well, that's a brilliant trick because basically what the directors have done is to tuck in a little five million provision, as it's called, a little bit of cushion in there, which if the company they've just bought doesn't perform as well as they expect after the acquisition date, they'll release back into the profit and loss account. Without going through the sort of uh, nitty gritty of the accounting, writing down the assets you're buying okay, allows the predators' directors to put a little bit of cushioning in the accounts for use later. All right, so it can really, if they get it wrong, if they can't run the business post acquisition, there's a little bit of bunts in there ready to be released back to the profit and loss account to help them out. All right, and don't forget that, okay, although there is in theory an annual impairment check on the carrying value of this mushy number called goodwill, in reality that's an incredibly subjective exercise. All right, so. What I've done so far in this video, I'm going to wrap up in a moment, is just to suggest that this goodwill number is important. It's a big fudge figure, okay? It's kind of a balancing number when you buy a company. Um, and the directors have a couple of ways, potentially, to pull the wool over your eyes. One is to increase it on the acquisition date and give themselves a little bit of bunts to tuck away and cushion bad results coming through later on. And the other way is, of course, to not take any meaningful impairment hit, reflecting the fact they overpaid in the first place until years later. And then one or two other problems as well. Right? Supposing you get out two sets of accounts, two different football clubs, or two different software companies, and you try and compare them. You'll struggle, and that's because the accountants, not content with this kind of fudgy mess here, have gone further. They said you can only recognise goodwill at all if you pay for it. So what if you're a football club that home grows all its talent? We well, haven't paid for that talent. So the accountants say, well those football players can't go on your balance sheet. Whereas if you bought a load of football players, well, they have a known market value, they can go on the balance sheet. So if you look at two football clubs, you'll find that they look radically different in terms of balance sheets. If one's homegrown all its talent, the balance sheet will be much, much, much smaller, all right? Because those football players won't be there because they can't be. Whereas another club that's bought players in will have them all on the balance sheet, believe it or not. And then how you impair a football player is an interesting question, all right? If they break their leg, for example, then obviously you've got to do some kind of write down, but that's the arcane world of accounting for you. Two software companies, one's bought brands, the other's developed its own brands, those balance sheets will look radically different. And it gets even worse, all right? Throw one of those sets of accounts away, all right, and look at the one that's left, you'll find that goodwill isn't treated the same as other intangible assets on the balance sheet, all right? So you might see other intangible assets sitting there being amortized, okay, while goodwill's being sat, sat there being subjected to this annual impairment review. In other words, the rules are a bit of a mess. All right, so as an investor, the message is this, goodwill is fiddly. It's a little bit complicated and it's an enormous fudge figure. All right, but you need to be aware of the basic mechanics because it does give the directors huge scope to play around with the numbers. And if you're thinking, well, what's the takeaway? What can I do with this? Be wary of fast growing 
acquisitive firms. All right, and the reason for that is acquisitive firms are often buying rather than growing their own. The scope for overpaying is huge, and the scope for playing around with the numbers, particularly in regard to goodwill, is also pretty large.